Hi everyone, welcome along. So last week we looked at kind of that first step, didn't we, in terms of what is single pane of glass reporting when you kind of get right down to it. We spent a lot of time on we looking at the the emphasis of it and how single pane of glass reporting is a as an idea is something that people often struggle with because it isn't hundred percent clear as to really what it means and the onus of the majority of data projects and data work that we see is around delivery of specifics. And single pane of glass reporting is about the opposite of specifics. It's about blending your results together or your, your projects and your programs of work together to deliver something that's actually long-term and meaningful. And that nature of that is difficult. So we'll have a look at some of the stuff that we've looked at, kind of a bit of a recap today, and then we'll look at where we're going to go for the next few weeks, because there's things to do really for each data set as we get them further forward. And that's the second part of this video, really, isn't it? That kind of what's coming in the future, but also emphasizing the point around single pane of glass reporting, really, and where the rubber meets the road and really where the benefits of it come through and really where for a business, that next step becomes much clearer. So here we are, I've broken the whiteboard out. Let's have a look at this and kind of wrap our heads around some of these concepts that we need really to get our head around. Okay, so We've talked, haven't we, about data flows and the use of them, and that we, we want to have some where we're going to be doing a lot of our processing. So kind of like this is sort of our processing space, isn't it, here? So ETL is happening here. Now, in our world and the way we're doing the videos, right, these are all Power BI workspaces. So Power BI, and I've called, I've started these with DF, okay? Data flow workspaces okay so data flow workspaces that's where we prepare them now the logic around that is to do with the management of it so data flows okay what we're really talking about with data flows is like engineering okay so engineering team and etl so that's the extract, transform, and load step. So what they're doing is they're going to access the source system, take the data from source, and process it. But the key thing, what you've got to come out with at the end, so the goal of this data engineering side is really to have tables of structured data. Okay, and I'm saying structured because they have to be structured. Hey, okay? now one of the things people, well, hang on, this doesn't make sense because for a cloud project, typically what we'll say is, all right, we just, you know, we lift and shift. Okay, so we do the straight extract and that makes sense. But that is of no use normally in an analytics environment. You have to process it, apply context, that kind of thing to it, which is where ETL comes through. We actually then transform with the data that we get into something usable and then prepare it to be loaded into the analytic system, which is really what these data flows do. They produce a table, a table or tables in a structured set. So what I would tend to do is say each data flow and the, and the corresponding workspace that it comes from would relate to a source system. Okay. So at that point, what we're starting to say is, you know, like this could be our SAP, for example, SAP um, could potentially have AD, and then we could have internal, yeah? Okay, so if there's like an internal database or something like that. The next step is going to be then, well, we pull these into one or more data models, okay? So we've got our data models coming through. So this could go through into here, as could that, for example. Okay, so we've then got these two areas come together to form a data set. 
Okay, we could go down the route and we say, well, actually, that we're going to build another one. Okay, let's pick a different color. Okay, so this could be our internal database and our SAP data, for example. Okay, that's our next data source. So we then get to this point, don't we? We've got these data models. Okay, and because data models can mix and match content from our data sources, from our structured tables, remember, that makes life very simple. And today I say, well, I need to do this really low level data model that has to be able to cope with everything versus saying I need an enterprise wide one picking everything from the tables across the whole business that potentially don't all necessarily align. Okay, and we can do all that. And a lot of people say, well, that's the single pane of glass reporting. Okay, and yes and no is, is kind of the truth. The single pane of glass effectively is this set here. Okay. Let's pick a different color. Let's pick um, purple, shall we? So down here, down here, this is our single, so we've got our single pane of glass here. And the, the pane of glass isn't actually report content. That's the bit that I think people go, what? Right? The pane of glass is that you've got a layer, a single place that you go to get all your content from. And these data models that you've got here, these semantic, this, this is your semantic data layer. Let's pull this all the way down. So this is. A semantic data layer. Okay, so these are the semantic models. Now, each model that we have, each semantic model is going to have tables, it's got all that, yeah, plus stuff. Okay, and it's the plus that adds the value. So tables plus relationships plus measures plus effectively context. Yeah? And that word context is the important part. That's the bit that's key. Because the context that's brought into your data by the semantic data layer is what then allows you to do the next bit, which is really where the power comes. And that's why these are the much bigger side. So for all we've got these bits here, where we've got our small data sets or our small workspaces that effectively are internal, we've got our data engineering one on the left, and we've got the one, the hybrid one, the single pane of glass reporting layer, our semantic layer, our data model workspaces where these semantic models live, and saying workspaces plural because it's not necessarily that you will have one workspace. You might turn around for different reasons and put and put them in different places. But there's there is a clear security reason that would drive you to say this model is going to go somewhere else. You might even get to the point of saying, well, we don't want to put data flows and models in separate workspaces because of the security of it. You know, if you're going in and saying, right, we're looking at an HR data set that's pulling together all the HR information across our enterprise globally, you may decide for security reasons, we want to combine that into one workspace, have the data flows ingesting all the data from the global systems and the data model exists there as well. Okay, there's nothing wrong with that. But because you have an approach you can understand, well, in this case, we have to have an exception. And the approach is the key. You know, we have to have the approach. The next step is going to be actually the one which is where we get to the, the real, oh, well, side of it. So workspace one that we've got here, if we were looking at a traditional reporting layer or a traditional solution that a lot of places will ask for a lot, a lot of people will see delivered. It's very much a, the legacy mindset. So the data comes out, we build the model, we build the report. One, two, three. So we have three workspaces or three areas, one, two, three. The core here is around saying, right, who is accessing the data? That's where it changes. Because in the first place, we've said, right, data engineering teams are going to do 
the ETL piece. We've then got the semantic modeling layer, which is going to be a mix of your engineering teams and your analysis teams, potentially, depending on where your skill sets lie within your business. Your, your analysts are going to know probably more DAX side as to how to write this, the, the equations, how the logic fits together, but understanding how to pull the tables through, potentially that's where you, you may need data engineering support. Okay, There isn't a right or wrong. This is more a data question. That's why I always say keep it separate because it's a different skill set. In terms of your consumption, though, given that Workspace ONE can now have report content coming from here and from here, yeah, and potentially from A and others that we have for it, why would we want to say, well, we want to restrict Workspace ONE to just be content from one report, from one data set, one semantic model? We wouldn't. It, it, it doesn't make sense. By doing it, where you can pull data from as many semantic models as you want into one workspace, you suddenly have a different way of working at it. Especially when you then do the sensible thing and also place an app in that workspace. Okay, so we've now actually got an app that's drawing everything together into it because everything already flows into our dashboard. Yeah, remember we built a dashboard last week? Let's actually do this properly. So these go into here, and then this comes through into the app. Okay, let's do it that way. Let's think of it that way. Yeah, so we've got to this point that within our workspace, we can pull in report content from lots of areas around the business from our single semantic reporting layer that we've got. And we know it's a single semantic reporting layer because I can go to Excel, I can go to Power BI Desktop as a, a non-report creator, and I can say, I wanna, what data can I see? And here's a list of your semantic models that you have access to. Oh, brilliant, right, that's my semantic reporting layer. Okay, this is just, that's what it is, okay? We pull those in and we publish this app here. And that one app, is going to be everything these people need. So that workspace one, that could suddenly be senior leadership team. Okay, workspace two, a similar thing, that could be our UK team, for example. Workspace three could be, say, our uh, US team. And workspace for just that could be the say manufacturing. Okay, so all of a sudden we've got this concept, haven't we? That we can build functional areas of consumption, and then because functionally people have one place to go, it's really simple. We can use Entra to actually be so. Azure AD, if you want to still be in the old-fashioned world, we use Entra to say, right, these people are going to be in these groups. That group has access to this workspace. That workspace has everything they need. There's an app there. They can access the app. It's all published through Entra. It's all managed through Entra. Everything's then used. We can use Teams for that as well, which, again, you can use Entra to put people in Teams, and then I can do that. Suddenly, it takes care of itself, right? And you're not then having to say, well, if you need the report from SAP, you need to go to this link. If you need the report from our internal database system, you need to go to this link. And then you need, they don't, the two don't mix. Suddenly, we're actually pushing it that we're going to say that these are going to mix. Yeah? So here we are, okay, in our dashboard area. This is the dashboard we wrote that we started last week. And what we can now start to see is we can do these, uh, we can change how this works, can't we? So we can turn around and we can say, right, we could put consistent information together so that we, it becomes really clear and easy for people to see what's going on in their in their area. And remember, this was this is going to be tailored towards our senior leadership team, for example. Okay, so what we've got here is our water tower locations. We've got our number of bike hires this year got a number of journeys this year. What we should do is bring in last year as well, but I just was being quick for you. Um, and start to piece together the information. And then obviously what I thought is we could put some maps below so we could see that kind of information around it. 
At the moment, we're just pulling in a map of everything, but there could be more. Now, the thing I wanted you to see, and I don't think we really covered last week, is around, in terms of access, well, what do these do? What's the point of having this dashboard? And the way these actually work is that these are effectively a menu system. So we've got something here saying we had 19 million bike hires. I could click on that, and it would then take me to the report page that that relates to. So we've got a high-level metric being brought to us here, and we can then see the map that shows us, oh, wow, this is actually what's been going on with the bike hires. And then we get a number come through, we get more information. It's suddenly the data flows through, we've got everything that works and is available. And if you remember, this is a direct query one, which is why it's potentially a little bit slower when you first do it, because the models all need to be woken up. So we could expand on this, we can do more. Now, if you remember in our previous video series, where we started to put together a scorecard, this is something we can do here. So we might put some scorecard elements right at the bottom where we can then start to tie those in to other things and track over time what happens. Because these are all menu items that they link to, we've got what three tiles wide, and we're what one, two, three, four, five, six deep that we can go. So effectively, we've got 18 tiles worth of space that we can use as a menu system to drive people straight into report content. We could also do other things as well. So we could have a menu that links to another dashboard, which then have the next level down of, of detail. But we've got to this point, haven't we, where for me and for my business, all I'm doing is going to one single location. So what are we doing then next, I hear you say? Okay, so the map is the first step here. And if we have a look at, if we go back into this report pack, we have a look at our map here, there's a couple of things going on with it. So firstly, the nature of the cycle data is we don't have regional information. We don't have, we've just got coordinates, right? Latitude and longitude and a street address. What we need to do is really get that into boroughs, but also we can see we've got some outside New York. So we've got some in Hoboken, got some in Jersey City as well. Okay, so there's gonna be some question marks about that, but I thought let's have a look and see where we are. Um, and what we've done here is we just put a reference layer so we can see where we are overlaying it, but it'd be nice if those dots had a different color. Yeah, it'd be nice to be able to do a legend on there like we do with the water towers. Okay, so in the water towers, there's a colored legend by different area. It makes it easier to consume. So for consistency, we should try and do that. We'll do the same with the taxi data. We can obviously do, we've got the color schemes for them. We can do it. We don't have latitude and longitude though. We've got, um, Right, small area, right, little small areas of, of each borough that we can drill down to. We use a shape map then to express that and seal that. So there's things that we'll have to do, but what it allows us to do is we can get to the point where fundamentally we can say, well, how many inspections have there been this year or how many bike rides have there been this year from the Bronx, from Brooklyn? Um, how many taxi rides have picked up in the Bronx or Brooklyn? How many taxi rides have dropped off in the Bronx or Brooklyn? Those are questions that we want to be able to answer with what we're doing, okay? And those are things that we're going to go through and do. So for the next couple of weeks, as I say, we'll answer those questions. So the first thing we're going to answer is in terms of we need to pull in the cycle data into a, a, a more geographical location, a geographical structure, which I've already started. So if we have a look at the data flow workspace here, you can see I've got a geostations data set. Okay, it's gonna need a manual cleanse. And the reality is there's 2,300 of these. I've used just a free lookup. In practice, if I was doing this, we would probably look to write something in terms of an API connector, going to Google, going to Azure Maps, going to um, something like that. Depend on the business, depend on the number. We'd look at where we can go. I mean, obviously the initial load will be potentially costly because um, you know, you're probably around the limit of free with your 2,300. What we would like to be able to do is then just do the new ones and just tweak the new ones. What's new, where's this, and get the address information from that. So it'd be a lot simpler. 
So what I thought we would do is we can write a power up for this, can't we? So we're going to take this data set, which, we, which we've got as a spreadsheet, because that's how it was all built, and push that all through into a SharePoint list and then create a power up from that that we can then manage and then treat, set some automate scripts to go and say, oh, we've had an update here. Um, and then just to you know show you how simple it is again and what we can do with it, the week after we'll do the same with the New York Water Towers because there's the manual data entry that goes in there in terms of the lab that's been used and who's done the inspection. And because that's manual entry, there's all sorts of ambiguities to it. I've written a spreadsheet in the past that goes through and allows us to pull it through using Power Automate, again, sorry, using Power Query, pulls through the, the exceptions, you then update the, the thing. We can do the same with a list. So we'll pull it into a SharePoint list. Um, we might see if you really want, you know, tell me down below in the comments. You know, we can use Dataverse, put it in Dataverse and see, does that make a difference? Does that make sense to do it that way? Um, how is Dataverse like to access, to do stuff with? So we'll do all those things. Um, in terms of the numbers, uh, you know, there's not really anything that's going to really cause too many problems in terms of using um, a SharePoint list. Um, you know, typically it's easy enough. You just work through a few things to make sure you get everything through. Um, so we can do that and we'll cover those two issues and actually then how to bring those into a power app. Because getting your head around the power apps, they're not just about data entry. They could be about data cleansing, about data fixing. Um, those kind of things, which we can then do with the power up. Continual improvement is, is a vital part of a good data project. There's not a case of saying, right, we've got a one and done for our data project. We've gone, we've got, we've delivered it, data project is now done. Okay. I've never known that happen because there's always going to be for a good data project, a, oh, what would happen if, oh, well, can we now do it this way? Oh, but what about, oh, okay. And every time someone goes, oh, okay, that means there's more work for us to do. So periodically, we need to be updating our models, okay? And what does that mean when we actually get right down to it? And this is much more something that needs to happen here, okay? So initially, it's going to be, I need to, you know, I want you to change. Is it going to be, let me pick a, so it does change, it need to happen here. Is this where we're changing? Yeah, are we changing report? If the answer is no, are we changing model? You know, is it a case of this new measure? Is there a relationship that needs to be updated or changed or tweaked or something like that? Okay, and then only as a last resort do we say, well, we're gonna go and change here. Okay, that's normal. However, you will also have, let me try and pick a, a non uh, similar color, cases where you've got, oh, we're gonna update our system. So that's gonna to need to be tweaked. And then we need to make sure that's tweaked. Okay, now if you do this correctly, when you tweak this, because you understand what's going on and the logic that needs to come out, you don't then have to go and tweak all the report content. Yeah, so that, 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 and that, they're all using it, just carry on working. But that will only come when you're really aware of what is going on at each layer within your entity, okay? And that's gonna be what we're gonna do in three weeks time. We go and we really do a deep dive into the model structures in terms of using, um, in terms of VertiPack Analyzer. So getting familiar and understanding VertiPack Analyzer and what it means and really how to read it and then how to understand what you're producing as a standardized report pack so you can understand or so you can make sure that changes in your downstream area yeah don't break other areas and getting it right makes a difference getting it wrong really hurts so what do you reckon then okay 
there's a lot here, okay? and we've deliberately covered more theory today than anything practical. This is about understanding that getting your workspace structures correct is half the battle, okay? When someone comes to you and says, I need a new report, we're not looking to say, right, we're gonna create a whole new report infrastructure for this one report, okay? Or taking like, that whole cookie cutter approach that's traditional. What we're actually gonna do is say, do we have a data model? Do we have a semantic model that already does 90 plus percent of it, even 60 plus percent of it today? And then we can produce from there is the more needed. And one of the things that benefits us with that is that, oh, I'd love to have, okay? Because if you can turn and say, well, I can get you 60% of it today, here you go, I can guarantee they'll go, oh, that's not what I was expecting, what about? And you could have spent two weeks and still get the, oh, what about with it? So it becomes a much more easier way of working. And again, that what about could be something that we can fix quickly and easily immediately. If not, then we feed it through into our various report update cycles that we've got. And these will depend on what you want to do. You know, workspace tweaks and changes, I would always say, you know, treat your reports within Power BI as almost like they're disposable. Um, because they don't contain data, the data exists elsewhere, they're just a visualization there. So if somebody says tomorrow, oh, I hate this report, I want something completely different, oh, okay, we can change it. We just archive the old one, here's the new one. We can even hide it from the app so it stays published, it's still available. Um, we could have, because we've got dashboards, we can have another dashboard tile right down at the bottom, say like legacy or old report area, and you can scroll down and see the old reports. And you know, now oh, this one's what I want to see. Um, can't imagine why you want to do it, but you can. And the nice thing is because everything all flows back through your semantic model, they all update automatically. And as long as your semantic model is maintained, the reports will all be maintained. So in theory, you can actually get to the point where multiple years of work and development have gone into tweaking and evolving and managing that model, while report content from very early on is still functional and available. And people can go back and they can cross-reference it. So as we've progressed, and then somebody says, oh, well, you know, in the old report, it said this. Let's go and have a look. What would the old report say now? And it's not sort of having to go away and rerun. It's just there. Hugely different way of thinking, hugely different way of working, much more efficient, much more beneficial to the business. Okay? So let's say, understanding that refresh cycle that you're going to use within your business and how you want that to work, what it works like, how people request it even. You know, how do I request that I want a new measure? Is it one that I should do something about? Is this something we should be doing? Are we going to use the ability to write custom measures within Power BI, thin reports, as something that we can do to say, well, does this work? You know, are we training our customers to be able to start writing their own measures and producing report content? It's all possible, but it comes down to understanding what your strategy is and how you best plan to optimize and deliver Power BI into your enterprise environment. Okay. As you know, obviously, Geordie Consulting, we're here. We do this day in, day out for businesses of all sizes. If you want to get in touch with us, have a conversation, even just like a, oh, I'm really not sure about, can you help me out? Okay. Send us an email, office at geordieconsulting.co.uk. We'll get back to you and we can have that conversation. We can hopefully get you back on track so you're moving forward. Okay. Otherwise, just let us know what you think down below. Tell us, is it, are we doing anything good? You know, is, are we doing anything terrible? Do you want to see more about the mapping that we're going to be doing with these data sets over the next few weeks? Let me know. Otherwise, stay safe, take care. Ta-da. <laughs>